Can you see? Can see that's the cordon up. Hi everyone and welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for August. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. We would be obliged if you would turn off your cameras and sound until the presentation is over. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum and it means that everyone can enjoy the webinar without hopefully any delays or screens freezing as well. Pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today what the weather's like. It's been lovely in Scotland. We're sitting about 26 degrees today um, and I was actually fortunate enough to get out into a graveyard and have a look about for a grave in the lovely weather, which was, um, yeah, it was nice to get away from my desk today. A um, couple of announcements. The next Kilted Culture Virtual Conference takes place on the 10th of September, so it's about a month away. Um, it starts at 2 p.m. UK time, 9 a.m. Eastern time, and the topic will be industry and occupations. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, run through um, who the speakers are. Yep. So we have Justin Parks from he's, he's from Summerlee Museum, which is pretty local to us, and he'll be doing a talk on Scottish steelworks and coal-fired ironworks industry. Um, Stephen Clancy um, is from Paisley and he's going to be giving a talk on the lives of Paisley weavers. And then Dr Irene O'Brien, um, who I'm sure most of you will know, is going to be a talk on My Ancestor Was and she'll give us some tips and tricks on how to find out more um, on the occupations that your ancestors um, worked in and the industries that they worked in. And then we have Neil Fraser from Historic Environment Scotland and he's going to be talking about um, the industrial collections within their archives as well. Okay. So many things open here now. Um, the next one that we actually have after that is in October. Let me see if I can get the details up for that as well. Yep, so the next one we've got is Creating Your Family Story, which takes place on the 15th of October. Um, this is in line, obviously, with Scotland's Year of Stories and it's to give some tips and tricks on how to create your own family story and pull everything together. And the speakers for this one are Angela Day, who will be talking about how to showcase your family photos in the best light. Sean, who's actually on the call tonight, will be talking about how to engage children and older relatives and actually Pay attention to this picture here that we have of Sean in a uniform. As he said, um, we should have been wearing that tonight, but it was so hot. So um, I'm sure we can let him off with it due to the weather. And then we have Claire Miller on story issues, who's going to give us a story creating workshop. So it'll all be about um, the plots, the characters, how to pull it all together. And then there's myself on genealogy journaling and how to pull together journals and, and some inspiration for journals. And then Christine Woodcock on pulling it all together. Um, and that's us basically for September and October. So it's a couple of busy months. Uh, and re really looking forward to it as you go into the autumn as well. Um, I've actually had word as well that there's going to be a sort of family history conference in Rutherglen in October. The details haven't yet been released for it. But I know that Lanarkshire Family History Society is going to have some tables and a military table there as well. And I'm going to be there with hopefully some RAF um, uniforms and, and details as well. So I will let you know more about that um, in the newsletter and during next, next month's event as well. Um, so we'll move on to our speaker. Um, speaker this evening is Sean, um, who is a Titanic historian, collector and director of Titanic Honour and Glory Limited. For over 20 years, his company has been providing touring exhibitions and artefacts relating to Titanic, World War I and World War II, to museums and galleries across the world. His company also provides presentations to a number of groups and charitable organisations. Organisations, oh, can't speak tonight. Organisations 
of which includes Erskine, Blesma and the Scottish Wardblind, to name a few. Sean, how are you tonight? I'm fine, Chris, thank you. Um, just had a bit of a migraine headache earlier because of the direct sun uh, walking down the street and getting a glare of it, but hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, it'll clear up. So if I start talking a wee bit gibberish tonight, you'll understand what's that's happening. A, but that's every, all right. Fingers yeah. crossed, everything will go well. <laughs> just make sure you've got plenty of fluids, and if you need to pause for a minute to take a drink, then that's fine. I'm sure we can um, oh, thank you. sit back and it's, relax. It's so, getting a yeah. bit better now, hopefully. <laughs> good, okay, that's good. So yeah, tonight... Um, Sean's going to actually take us a step, um, we're going to step on board the legend, legendary liner um, as Sean reveals the love story, the true love story on board history's most famous ship, the RMS Titanic. So I will hand over to you, Sean, you should be able to share your screen. That's lovely, thank you very much Claire. I'll, I'll just share my screen just now and uh, hopefully... If, if anyone has any questions for Sean, you can put them into the chat box. And hopefully um, everybody can see the screen. I'm sure I'm full screen there yet. Uh, aha, there we go. I think this is as full it's screen. kind of split between page one and two. Oh, right. Um, oh, I do apologise, Liz. Um, can you see the screen? Is it is it quite full for you? Um, yeah, so I'm still seeing the toolbar down the, right, the left-hand side. Oh, right. Okay, let's see if we can present. There we are. I pressed the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> there we go. So let's go for present. There we go. That's better. Aha, that's a better Perfect view. So picture. that's lovely where you can see that modern technology, as we say, but there we yeah. go. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to speak to everyone this evening and thank you very much for coming along. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the real love story on board the Titanic, um, a love of the sea. And I was very good friends with the, the daughter of the couple that we're going to talk about tonight. And it's really through her story that this story came to, to fruition. So we're going to go back to what we're going to do tonight. So the topic presentation there will be where it all began, Morley's High Class Confectioners, a favourite for all school children, Karen Kate, the shop assistant, we're falling in love, decisions to be made, a token of my love, boarding the Titanic, last night together, and then we have disaster strikes, goodbye my sweetheart, and return to Britain and uh, my my wish, my last wish, which we will go into further detail as we go along. So hope you all sit back and enjoy this presentation. And if you have any questions, like Claire said, please put them in the chat box and I'll be very happy to help um, as we finish this evening. So going on to the, the first part of the story is we're going to go back to where it all began. And we are in Borgate Street in Worcester, in Worcestershire, where it's you know, the Garden of England, as we're known, near Birmingham. And this gentleman that we have to the left here in the picture is a man called Henry Samuel Morley. Now, Henry Samuel Morley was a very well-known man, a pillar of the community. Um, he had three shops, a great businessman. He had one in Fourgate Street, which is just along the street here that you can see near the railway station. And it was Morley's high-class confectioners selling, you know, great establishment of chocolate and confectionery for, for many people around the area. He also had a shop in New Street in Birmingham, and he also had one in Great Malvern. So these three shops were very, very popular and became such a favourite with many of the locals and many people out with the locality as well. Now, he was in his 40s and he had two brothers as well. So the three brothers all had a share in the business. And what makes this story interesting is that as we go further in, um, we can see in the picture here to the right hand side, we have a beautiful 19 year old girl called Kate Louise Phillips. She was a well known from the Phillips family, um, a working class girl who her grandfather was in charge of the, the Seven Locks Canal. Um, they were very much like many of the other people and individuals at that time. They were just making ends meet in a way. So she went along and she was interviewed by Morley's, as we can see in the picture. This is the shop here and the one in Malvern to the left hand side of there as well. And she was interviewed. She was given the job and she came across as a very, very, um, very, very well respectable lady. And what, what really shone through with her was her beauty. And, her, you know, she had so much charm to talk to people. And as Henry would say that she was a very good seller, you know, she could sell a lot because people just really warmed her. 
So she started working in, in the Morley shop. And as, as we go into the Morley shop, she, you know, you think about the old traditional sweetie shops, the confectioners, and we can see the children from the Edwardian Society would, would come in there in their droves during their break times, either before school or after school. And they would, they would just love coming in to see Kate. And one of the things about Kate was she had a really good heart. She had such a warm heart for children, especially. And what she did was she, she actually, believe it or not, gave chocolate away freely to some of the children that were really in a part of poverty because she felt so, so sorry for them. And Henry Samuel Morley would frequent his shops very, very regularly, as most business owners would do. And he would go between Birmingham, Worcester and Great Malvern. And he would come into the Worcester shop where he would see this young girl and he would ask her how, he's, how she's getting on, catching up. And there was almost like a spark in a way where there was this friendship that just started. And the friendship would then blossom into real closeness, where he would frequently shop quite a lot to, to catch up with her. And many of the staff would notice this. And as we say, she was a very caring girl who would look after a lot of the children in Worcester who were really didn't have a lot of money. Um, they were under a lot of poverty. And, and she really did become such a caring, caring girl that she would be nicknamed Caring Kate, the shop assistant. And then a lot of the children would always sing her praises as they danced down the street, as they got, as they would call it, a poke of sweets, you know, the old sweetie packs and the brown paper bags. So what would happen next is that there would be weird falling in love. So Henry and Kate would fall in love. There would, this relationship would blossom. There would be love letters sent from Henry to this young girl. It was almost like a Catherine Cookson novel in a way, if you can imagine this scenario, that Edwardian gentleman who was very elegant, a very handsome looking dapper man, and this real girl who came from, from nothing really, poverty stricken family, um, that really looked beautiful, looked, looked a stunning, gorgeous looking girl. And the two would, would come together, which may really would make an amazing film actually. And we can see some of the examples of letters that were sent across about the love he had for her, how much he was falling for her. She reciprocated in the same manner as well. And they would have secret rendezvous so that Edwardian society at the time was very, very much a, a, of a time where people would have frowned upon, you know, couples coherent like this and, and almost in a secret way as well. And... As we go further on, we have a situation where decisions have to be made. And this is where we're really going to drop the bombshell in a way about Henry Samuel Morley, and it may actually shock some of the viewers. But Henry Samuel Morley, in his mid-40s, we can see him with his brothers here in 48th Street in Worcester, he's actually married with a child of his own, but yet he's fallen in love with this young shop assistant who's more than half his age. So you can imagine why they were having the secret rendezvous where they didn't want people to know what they were doing. They didn't want people to, to be aware of this because this would have been a scandal in Edwardian society. This would have been a scandal that would have rocked Henry Samuel Morley's world and that of his family's world as well. And as well as the, the young Kate Louise Phillips, she would have been in a situation where she would have been really the family would have been, in a way, everybody would look down on and it would have been a very much of a shock, a, a, a real terrible situation to be in. So he confided with his brothers and he decided that he couldn't live without her. He was not wanting to do the secret liaisons anymore. He wanted her to be part of his life. So he decided that he would sell his share of the business to the rest of his family, to his brothers, so that they could have money to, to make a new life in America. And this was his plan. So the brothers knew about it, but they had to come up with a plan. They had to think, well, how are you going to go away without people knowing what's happening? So they come up with this audacious plan of that he was going to be recuperating from an illness so that nobody would talk, no eyes would be watching, and no tongues would be wag wagging, basically, with the Edwardian gossip. So what he does was he goes away and he organises a token of his love. And this token of his love was actually from Birmingham at the Jewellery Quarter, which is very well known. 
and he went and he purchased this beautiful sapphire and diamond necklace and it was to be given to Kate Louise Phillips as what it says, a token of his love. And it was going to be a real presentation of his feelings for her and to surprise this young girl. And what they did next was incredible. He had actually organised bookings for tickets at the White Star Line offices in, in Birmingham. And he actually purchased tickets 250655 for the pricely sum of £26 to join the Titanic in Southampton under the assumed names of Mr and Mrs Marshall. Now, the reason he chose two assumed names was because if you were not married travelling on board Titanic, you would actually be expected to be at separate parts of the ship. It was against Edwardian times, such as the Titanic and other shipping companies, that, you know, it was very strict. If you weren't married, you weren't allowed to share the same cabin. So they made their own way separately, I have to say, down to Southampton. Henry went ahead of Kate Louise Phillips just to, to avoid any suspicion. And Kate Louise Phillips then followed. So you can imagine what happened, the scenario, once they arrived in Southampton, the two of them met up and... They had this dream, this a real ambition that you were going to have their new life. They were going to be going to San Francisco in California, where they were going to establish a new chocolate business, you know, confectioner's business there to give that same effect to the children and many of the citizens in San Francisco, the same they had in Birmingham, Great Malvern and Worcester. So when they got on the Titanic, you can imagine this young girl who came from a very much of a working class family who were just really on the breadline. Coming on board in second class on the Titanic was something special. It was like first class on any other ocean liner of the time. It was so grand, it was unbelievable. So they boarded the ship with their sea trunks, as we can see in this image here, their uh, tickets. And also this is an example of a second class bag uh, baggage label that would go on their bags. And they would enter a privileged world. The second class staircase was something special. We had beautiful hand-carved English oak balustrades, beautiful oak panelled walls. We had the new technology and new design was linoleum floor tiles. This was the first time this was ever used on any ocean liner and that was on Titanic. And we've got to imagine walking down the staircase. When you think about the back room and kitchen that Kate would have been used to in Worcestershire with no lavatory, no washing facilities apart from an outhouse building, she must have felt like she was entering a privileged world such as a palace. And we even look at their accommodation, a second-class cabin such as this with steward service or a stewardess coming in daily to meet your needs, supply your fresh water, you know, your cups of tea, coffee, or even hot chocolate, for example, and some biscuits or some cakes. Everything was given to you. You were treated like royalty on the Titanic. It was, it was an absolutely luxury beyond any level that anyone can imagine. And here she was in this world with her beloved Henry Samuel Morley on their way to America to start that new life. Now, what was it like traveling second class on Titanic? As we said, it was like, you know, equivalent to first class on any other ocean liner at the time. Absolutely abundant with luxury. The spacious um, boat deck that we can see here was the second class boat deck with this beautiful deck benches and the areas that you could walk around and promenade special and lovely weather like we've had today. Um, it was an experience that, to be had and especially Henry and Kate would enjoy promenade and walking along the decks as we can see in this example picture of the two ladies on the deck of the ship. So it gives you an idea of just what it was like. Now, the second class dining room was out of this world. It was done in beautiful carved oak panels, beautiful sea view air you could see there, uh, views through the windows. The steward service was unbelievable. They would come to your table and ask what you would like. You would not need to leave your table at all. They would actually bring the food to you. That's how, how it was on the ship. And here we can see an example from a breakfast menu on the Titanic. Now, what, what's incredible about this is it gives you an idea 
just for breakfast, I don't know how everybody else feels looking at this menu, but that's just a breakfast menu. And I think that would be quite a substantial amount of food to eat at breakfast time for myself, especially. I would struggle with a lot of this. And Kate would have shone brightly as she walked in there that evening, as she was presented with this beautiful token of a love for her by Henry Samuel Moore, the sapphire and diamond necklace. And as she sat down at a table such as this, she would have been very much looked, at, looked across. Many people were looking at her. Many people were admiring her beauty because she was so flawless. She was like a lady herself. But if anybody on board had known the secret that they carried on board, I think there would have been a lot of tongues wagging and gossiping going on. It was um, just incredible. But you get an idea of just how grand the, um, the second class dining room would have been. Their last night together was very special. They, they had attended the, the church service, the divine service by Reverend Ernest Carter in the second class dining saloon. And they would have praised God. They would have praised God with various hymns. And thereafter, they would have, like many other passengers, taken a stroll along the second class boat deck, taking in the fresh air, watching the sunset go down, and generally just grooming and having that captured dream in their minds together as they looked at each, each other's eyes together, holding their hands, thinking about their future together, landing in America and arriving in San Francisco in California. It must have been an, an amazing experience for this young girl who was 19 years old and everything that she had left behind for this new world. But then we think about Henry Samuel Morley. And then what happened, how he had left his wife and his child to go away with his new love of his life to America. It must have been a, a terrible situation at that time for, for his wife and his, and his daughter. But we'll come more on to that as we go on. So as we all know, Titanic strikes the iceberg at 11.40 p.m. But just before we get to that point, we look at what happened to Mr. and Mrs. Marshall, the assumed names of Henry and Kate. They would have went down to the second class stateroom. They would have went to bed, turned their lights out and fallen asleep. The Titanic was, feel, was going at full speed. And as this gentleman here, Fred Fleet, sees the iceberg, he rings the bell, three sharp rings, shouts hard, iceberg right ahead, telephones the bridge. Officer Murdoch here, first officer on the bridge, actually seen the iceberg as it was almost upon the Titanic, and he gave the order, hard a starboard, full, full astern, and then close the watertight doors and hard the port to try to very much swerve the iceberg in a way. But it's sad to say the disaster would happen, as we all know, and Titanic would be mortally wounded as her compartments were filled with water with the strike on the starboard side of the bow area. And what was unbelievable next was that you've got to imagine that on the Titanic, people could not believe that the unsinkable would sink. It was an unthinkable thing to, to, um, to comprehend. Many stewards and stewardesses going around chapping cabin doors, stateroom doors, and pleading with passengers to dress warmly, wear your life jacket, and make your way to the boat deck, captain's orders. It was almost falling on deaf ears sometimes. As one passenger would turn around and say to a steward, don't be absurd, the Titanic can't sink. God himself can't even sink this ship. And he said it was preposterous. And he closed his door, went back to his bed, and he fell asleep. Later that evening, or into the early hours of the morning, believe it or not, a gentleman awoken as he was sliding to the footboard of his bed because of the lust that the Titanic was taking. So that's just to give you an example of the, the people on Titanic that had this disbelief that the ship would not sink. They, they couldn't believe it. And what happened with the Morleys was there was a chap at the door and the knock on the door with a chap, chap, chap was a stewardess. And she had said to Mr Morley, I'm sorry, sir, um, captain's orders, could you please... Um, wear your warm clothing, your life jacket, and make your way to the boat deck. But Henry Samuel Morley knew there was something wrong because obviously he was a very much well-known businessman. He had a good head on his shoulders, and you could see that the stewardess was, in a way, trembling. And he asked her, he said, Madam, he says, 
could I ask, he says, what, what really is the situation? And she says to him, and then a fellow steward came along and also spoke at the same time and says, sir, we are in a precarious situation. The Titanic has collided with an iceberg and the ship is going down. When captain's orders to get everyone up to the boat decks and away to safety as soon as possible. And with that, he was a very well calm man. He went in, closed the door, and he went up and got Kate from bed. And he said to her, come on, dear, he says, it's time to, to get dressed warmly and get you up to the boat deck. And she always remembers looking into his eyes and the blank expression on his face, but she thought there's something not right, but she obeyed him. And what she left the Titanic with that night, or left the cabin, was a dressing gown and then a jacket over the top of that and her sealskin burst with the cabin trunk keys to all the sea, you know, the trunks that were in the cargo hold. And they were going to get this when they arrived in New York. And she also had the diamond necklace on as well. So you can imagine as she came up this staircase, coming up to the boat deck to this area here, it was absolute pandemonium. There was many people gathering around the staircase itself. The lifts were not going to be in use after a certain amount of time, and this was one of the lift shafts on the Titanic second-class area to the boat deck. And it was the first ship that had second-class lifts in any ocean liner at the time as well, so that was another new thing on the Titanic. So Kate would have came out here, and as we can see in this picture here, would have embraced Henry and asked, aren't you coming with me? And as Henry would say as a gentleman, no, no, I must stay behind and wait till all the ladies and the children are away, then I will join you. And he said to her, not to worry, he would catch up with her soon. And he kissed her hand, as we can imagine in this picture, as she stepped into the lifeboat. And what happened in the lifeboat was quite incredible. And here we can see in this illustration there, you can imagine this was Henry and Kate together there saying their last goodbyes. And that was what he said to her. He says, goodbye, my sweetheart, I will see you soon. And it was the last words he would ever say to her. And this was the sealskin purse and the cabin trunk, trunk keys that we spoke about and the sapphire and diamond necklace. But she said it was absolute pandemonium on the boat deck. There was many people swaying to and forth. There were people rushing the boats. There was officers trying their best to shout to abate the amount of people coming forward. Plus the noise of the venting steam from the forward funnels was so deafening that people couldn't hear themselves. And she could remember the huge drop to the bottom of the ocean and she thought it just seemed to go into a black abyss. She couldn't see the end of it. But as she got into the lifeboat and it started to lower, she then could feel this immense cold that went right through her body. She said she could not feel any part of her body. She was so cold. She was shivering. Even, she said, her teeth were clattering together. That's how cold it was. And people huddled together like this in the lifeboats to keep themselves warm. There was babies wrapped in fur coats and shawls to keep them warm as well. And along with this, there was women sobbing, crying, as they knew they were looking at their husbands and never to see them again, sadly. But she kept looking at the area of where Henry Samuel Morley was, and she could still see him. And she could just see him being swallowed up in a way with all the crowds as they rode away from the Titanic, as the Titanic was slowly sinking. And she remembers in this picture, as you can imagine, that you can see the distress rockets being fired. And that these were used to try and attract attention from other ships that were close by, such as the Californian, sadly, who had turned the radio off and were not able to respond to the Titanic's uh, distress call. And she says, as further and further we could go, we could hear the screams, the shouts, we could hear the band playing, and the band was playing very much very much, as she says, the ragtime tunes of the day, you know, very much popular tunes. Then she could remember the, uh, the, the incredible hymn, Nearer My God to the Years, it was played. And she remembers, like this picture here, the last image that was always forever etched on her memory of her beloved Henry as he looked at her and said to her to get into that lifeboat. And that was a lifeboat that she got into, was lifeboat number 11. And... It was a traumatic time for her. She said, you know, she never, ever forgot it. She never got over it. And it seemed to be they were in the water for many hours. And she said, finally, when the Titanic disappeared, there was this huge amount of just darkness everywhere. And there was silence as well. All you could hear was women crying, 
people that were in shock. Um, there was just nothing to see apart from all the stars in the sky. She said you could see all the heavens, all the stars. Then early morning, just after four o'clock, the Carpathia arrives under the command of Sir Arthur Henry Rostron here, an incredible man who raced through 58 miles through the North Atlantic Ocean that night to get to the Titanic's position. He was really the only one that would respond to save the Titanic. So it was their saviour, as she would say, our saviour, the Carpathia. And she said what was quite alarming was when they grew up against the Carpathia, they had to climb a rope ladder. And it was a terrible situation because you've already seen a ship sink. You've already come through that trauma of losing your loved one, the cold, the sheer uh, distress of everything. And here you are in a small lifeboat that can take 65 people and almost 70 people that push. And you're trying to leave that and climb up a rope ladder that sways from side to side. And she says many people were traumatised. It was unimaginable, the situation. But while they were on board the Carpathia, they were given clothes, they were given food from fellow passengers on the Carpathia, who all came out, out of humanity to help. And Captain Rostrum was given such a hero, um, a heroism, because he was given the Congressional Medal of Honour from America, which is only ever given to American citizens. But here we have this British man who was a merchant officer who was given this incredible honour because of his bravery that night. And every member of the crew, the officers were given medals as well. There was gold, a silver and a bronze one for, for their participation and the save of the 705 survivors of the Titanic um, that evening. It was incredible. So arriving in New York must have been such a traumatic event. All their hopes and dreams, as we can see in this picture, is this is real footage of the Carpathia arriving into New York City on post-Titanic tragedy. With all the survivors on board, everything they had lost on the Titanic, everything they had was the clothes and the shoes or dressing gowns on their back. Can you imagine passing the Statue of Liberty in New York when you had your dream that you were going to be arriving there with the love of your life to start a new life in California. And that's what Kate had to, to deal with. Then there was going to be subsequent inquiries. And how could you keep the secret away from the public eye? Well, sad to say that the secret would then unearth itself. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But just to give an idea of the Titanic tragedy, people were really shocked. They couldn't believe that the unthinkable had happened, that the unsinkable had sank. So the sad loss of life was incredible. First reports were there was 1,500 to 1,800 people who were lost on Titanic. John Jacob Astor, who was among them, was the wealthiest man on board, Benjamin Guggenheim. Uh, there was many heroes that night, including engineers who stayed on the ship to keep the power going. We had Captain Smith, who was a brave man who went down with his ship. Many of the, the crew members, even stewardesses, stewards had lost their life on Titanic. So there had to be an inquiry into this disaster and there had to be answers for those who had remained, who had survived about the loss of their loved ones. And it was at that point that the secret would come out about the love affair that happened between Henry Samuel Morley and Kate Louise Phillips. It would then come out that they had really made this name up under the assumed name of Mr. and Mrs. Marshall to travel to America, finding there what you would really say was an affair. So the return to Britain, as we can see, was, was, an, was an eventful one on board the Celtic. And she was another White Star liner that was bringing passengers back. There was another ship called the Lapland, which was the Red Star liner, and bringing other survivors back. They would come back to, to Plymouth, where they would be under almost like a house arrest because there was going to be another inquiry in Britain, which was held under by Lord, presided over by Lord Mersey. And here we can see some of the crew the, and some survivors arriving back um, from, from America. Now, out of the disaster, yes, there was um, a, a glimmer of hope. There was a, was a part of great greatness that came from that. And the only thing we could say about that was this lovely child here. And the story goes that she, Henry Samuel Morley and Kate Lees Phillips had conceived a baby on board the Titanic, mid-Atlantic voyage. And in January 1913, here we have 
Mary Ellen Mary Walker, or Mary Ellen Walker, as she would like to be known as well, Betty, I would call her, she was born. And she was born into a, a family in turmoil because this affair had been known, the Morley family and the Phillips were now in a way, it was almost like a war between the two of them. They were so angry with one another that this situation had happened. And as we said, it's almost like Catherine, Catherine Cookson's story, you could imagine, with the situation occurring. And we can see that she returned again with the sealskin purse and the cabin trunk keys and also the diamonds and sapphire necklace. Now, this sad to say that this young, beautiful child would go through uh, a, a real terrible situation when she was growing up. Sad to say that Kate Louise Phillips was suffering from post-traumatic stress. She could not cope with what had happened, nevertheless having birth to a baby daughter. She was happy at the start, but then she started to turn um, quite abusive, um, that so much so that she was really in a bad way, in a bad state mentally, that she was incarcerated into a, an institution for mental health. Now you've got to imagine, back in Edwardian times, what we have now recognised as mental health was never really fully recognised at that time. People were were classed terrible things and they were, they were actually put away under lock and key and subjected to terrible, terrible situations. So that's what happened to poor Kate Louise Phillips. And this young child here, Mary Ellen, was brought up with her grandparents, the mum and dad of Kate Louise Phillips, and believing that her grandfather was her father, her grandmother was her mother. And now this is where things was really sad for this young child because she got so attached to them and she really believed that this was her mummy and her daddy. So she would go to school, she would enjoy life, she would get into you know, the teenage years. Then one day there's a knock at the door and there's a woman strange standing in front of her. And she answers the door and looks at her puzzled and says, can I help you? She says, you must be my daughter. You must be Mary Ellen. And the, the, you know, Mary Ellen standing there thinking, what is going on? Who's this woman? Then the parents come out and then the truth comes out that this is her grandparents and not her mum and dad. And me, uh, Kate Louise Phillips would then turn around and say to her, you're my daughter and I'm taking you back. And obviously because she's the maternal mother, she had the rights to do that. So she takes her daughter away with her. And the story again gets really, really bad for this poor lady. She then goes through terrible traumatic times. She's locked in a cupboard. She's beaten with sticks. She's fed bread and water. She's subjected to mental torture and the cruelty was just unbelievable from her birth mother. And you know why all that happened was because she would look at her certain days and Kate Louise Phillip would fly off the handle very, very sharp and shout to her, don't ever look at me like that again. That's how your father looked at me as, he left, as I left him on the Titanic. And it was this almost um, traumatic post-traumatic stress disorder that really incited all this and Kate Louise Phillips, sadly. And so much so that the relationship between mother and daughter really, really broke down, that she left the family home. She didn't want to know her mother anymore. She thought, why would my mother treat me like this? Why would my mother lock me in a cupboard? Why would she beat me with sticks? It wasn't someone you love would do that to you. That, that's what she felt. So the, the relationship was really over at that point. And it really hurt her in later life because she said that she wanted to be close to her mother, but she just couldn't be because of how she was treated. And it really left a scar, an emotional scar on, on Mary herself, sorry, Betty herself. Well, she was in her 80s at this point and she was living in our beloved uh, homeland of Worcester. She went back to live in Worcestershire and we can see her here as an elderly lady. She's a very lovely lady. She... Um, she was very much well known in the Titanic community. She would go to Titanic conventions. She would open up exhibitions. She would be co-authoring our forwards for books, um, talking about, um, you know, she had heard the story about she was connected to the Titanic. She had learned about her father um, was Henry Samuel Morley, but the Morley family dismissed this constantly and always said to her that they did not want anything to do with her and, and basically brushed her aside, she would say. And it hurt her immensely that her heart was really broken because she showed me a birth certificate once and she said, she said, look at my birth certificate, father unknown. She says, all I want is to have father 
Henry Samuel Morley to be recognised as his daughter. And she had no recollection of what it looked like because the Morley family didn't want to talk to her. And it wasn't until one evening, so one afternoon, she was sitting in a cafeteria in a cafe. She was with friends and they were having their lunch. And all of a sudden, they opened up the Worcestershire Evening News, the newspaper, and she dropped her cup and her sandwiches as she started to cry. And everybody wondered what was wrong. They thought she had something that happened to her. And she was sobbing her heart out, she said. And all she could see, the title, Worcestershire Men Who Went Down With The Titanic and who was in the picture was her father. And she said in her own words to me, can you imagine living your life to your senior years, not knowing who your father looked like, not knowing much about him, only fragments of a story, but to see him in person was so, so incredibly heartwarming. She said she was just so emotional. She couldn't stop crying that day. Well, there was this evening the news presented her with a beautiful framed picture of her father, which she kept at her bedside. And every night before she went to sleep, she would always lift her father's picture and she would kiss her father's picture and say, good night, Dad, I love you so much, and turn the light out. And she would always cry and tell me the story when she would talk about it. That's how emotional she was about and she loved her father dearly. She loved her father. She said, I never knew my father, but I love him so dearly. And he's always in my heart. And wherever she would go, she would always take a picture of her father with her as well. And unbelievably, she would track the family story down. She would go to Birmingham. She'd go to Great Malvern, where this picture was taken with the mosaic floor to the entrance of the Morley shop. And the press would then you know, get involved after the James Cameron film came out, the, the famous Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet story, because they thought in a way, they thought this was similar to her life story, her mum and dad, you know, going on this beautiful ship, the, the, the diamond in the film. It was almost like a, a mirror image of her story, changed in slight ways, but very similar. And she was a wonderful woman that was always happy to talk to children and to, talk to many people about the Titanic. And as she would say, she was living in the shadow of the Titanic. Shadow, you know, the Titanic became part of her life. She would do many interviews. She would do many press uh, calls, photographs. She would sign many postcards, paintings of the Titanic. And this was all done, not for any personal gain. It was all done that she said it would keep her father's legacy alive. It would tell everybody about her father to keep his memory alive as well. And that was very, very important to her. And... She had a very interesting life during World War II and during the, the German the Luftwaffe Blitz of Britain, especially in London. She used to go down the, um, the London Underground where it was used as a, an area shelter and she would get the children, she would sing and she would make them feel relaxed and she would go around all that area trying to calm people. And she was very much well respected for her, her work in that. And then she would be, another part of history was another amazing one where she was uh, at the Old Bailey giving evidence um, on the fraudulent or fake passports of the notorious great ones who were the gangsters of the East End of London. And she always used to say to me, she said, I've had two incredible, well, four incredible parts of history, she said. I was on Titanic because I was conceived on board. Um, my father and my mother were there. I've come through the First World War, I came through the Second World War, and now I came through this time where I was under witness protection for the rest of my life because I've given evidence because I worked at the British Passport Office and seemingly she was involved in discovering the fraudulent passports of the, of the notorious great ones. So she always used to have a joke about it saying, you know, that she's watching her out her windows every night, making sure her doors are locked. But she was always being checked upon because uh, that's what she always used to tell me. It was quite an incredible story that she came through all of this, um, an incredible woman. Sad to say that, you know, that she, all she wanted was my life's only wish was to be recognised, certificate of registry of birth, as you can see in the picture, to have her uh, father's name there as her paternal father. That's all she wanted. And it was continually blocked by the Morley family, continually refused because they felt that this lady was not who she was. But a matter of fact, she was, and we'll talk about that in a moment when DNA evidence did eventually 
give that information, but sad to say she would pass away before this was done. So we, one of the last times I've ever seen her was this picture here, very sad to say. This was her in her care home in Worcester, and <laughs> she used to always enjoy, um, you know, a, a nice drink, uh, biscuits, and, you know, taking her some Scottish shortbread down, for example, and, and, and generally would sit for hours and hours and talk and talk. And you know the amazing uh, experience I've always had with her was not for me to talk, for me to listen. I used to always enjoy listening to every single word that she would speak. And I was really amazed because it was this incredible, tangible link with history that she was a key, a connection to the future of what their family life could have been. And she always used to say, what my life would have been like if we had got to America? I would have been born in San Francisco. I would have been a, an American citizen. She says, goodness knows what my life would have been. She says, but that's my crossroads. She says, we'll never know. But sad to say that the dream never came through. She never got her wish. Um, on a, one of her last birthdays, we presented her with lots of flowers and balloons, made her feel like a queen for the day in the care home. And everybody were singing songs. And it got to the point where, I know it's not nice to say, but you know, a friend of mine who's a Titanic author, John Hodges, and myself would go and see her quite a lot. And we would say to her, but you are Henry's daughter. You are. Everybody believes you because you wanted her to have that fulfillment in her life. You didn't want her to feel sad because she would cry quite a lot, actually, in her real senior years. Just before she passed, she always used to cry very much every time I would see her because it really broke her heart. And that, that's, that's exactly what happened. And this was the picture that she would speak and kiss each night before going to sleep. And just going on to the, the picture, which was very, very sad, that, you know, at rest with my dearest father, is what she always used to say, she would, she would very much wish. And when she had passed away, it was very, very sad to say, it was very sudden, uh, it was unexpected. Um, she passed away and our funeral service was, was very emotional, actually. And we had... Uh, Nearer my God to thee, playing at the service as well. And what she wanted for her last wish was for her cremated remains to be taken out from Padstow Point in Cornwall on the RNLI uh, lifeboat. And it was to take out towards the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the two reasons we, that this, was, this happened, the RNLI, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, was very, very important in her life. As she said to me, if it wasn't for a lifeboat, I would never be here today. So that was one big thing she really wanted to do. She left a much of a state to the RNLI to help them with their life-saving at sea. She then said that I wanted to be at rest with my father. So what other way would take to the North Atlantic as close as possible that could be done by the RNLI lifeboat there to the area of the Titanic's position, which was quite a distance, obviously, but as long as her ashes were scattered at sea, that's what she wanted. And that way, she felt she had closure. Now, I went on to talk about um, where the family, the Morley family, finally recognised her at one point was generations later. So you're talking about, say, third generation of the Morley family. They did not have this horrible animosity towards the Phillips family, especially to Kay and, and young Betty, the baby. They then accepted the truth. And it was believed, as John would tell me, John Hodges, the author of that, the, the DNA analysis did prove that she was without doubt 100% Henry Samuel's daughter. But it was so sad that it came too late. But I always wonder why could the Morley family not have even just said, OK, things happen in life, we move on from them. Uh, you know, this is your father, we want to welcome you to the family, we want to, to acknowledge that. And I think that would have given her, even to have the acknowledgement to give her that uh, real connection with her father and that love and to heal the broken heart that she really carried for many years. Well, I hope that you've, you've enjoyed the, um, the presentation and I, I do apologise if it's went on slightly longer than, than planned and uh, I do apologise if, as I say, I've had a bit of a migraine this afternoon, sadly, but I didn't want to cancel the talk. It's a very, very important story and I hope it's not infected the, the way I've put the, the story across for everyone. But we've got to finish off uh, an actual quiz and what we've done 
I know that a lot of presentations don't have quizzes, but it's, it's an option if you'd like to have a quiz and we, we can start off this just now. Um, you can either unmute yourself or if you want to put the answer into the, the chat box. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just move on to the first question. So we're going to ask is the multiple choices. What is this gentleman's name? Was it A, Henry Samuel Morley, B, Henry John Smith, C, Samuel Henry Jones, or D, John Henry Smith? So let's see who's, let's have a check in the chat box. Uh, let's see. Oh, well done. Someone's got A. So fantastic. That's great. Excellent. So we're doing well there. And how many shops did, did he have? Was it A6, B5, C1, or D3? Fantastic. So I've got a good answer there for Bob and Bar Barbara, Janice, and well done. Excellent work. And did, Samuel, did Henry Samuel Morley fall in love with his 19-year-old shop assistant? I think we'll all know the answer to that one. And what a, what a shoe name did Kate and Henry use when boarding the Titanic? Was it A, Mr and Mrs Smith, B, Mr and Mrs Williams, C, Mr and Mrs Marshall, or D, Mr and Mrs Davis? <laughs> Well done, see it was, so Bob and Barbara again, and Claire, that was fantastic, great answers. And which class did Henry and Kate board the Titanic? Was it A first, B second, or C third? Oh, fantastic, we've got great answers again from uh, second class from Bob and Barbara, and also Claire, well done. And true or false, did Henry give Kate a sapphire and diamond necklace on board the Titanic. Ah, that's fantastic. Well done. A is the correct answer. Well done. Janice there. And what was the name of Henry and Kate's daughter? Was it A, Helen Walkerton, B, Ellen Mary Walker, C, Ellie Martin, or D, Mary Ellen Walker? Okay, well done, Mary Ellen Walker's great answer. So well done to Janice and to Bob and Barbara. Fantastic. Okay, and we've also got a question time opportunity as well. So if you've got any questions that you would like to ask at all, please uh, use this opportunity to, to ask me. I'll be very happy to, to answer any questions that I can. Um. Thanks very much for that, Sean. That was amazing. Um, You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> I've got so many questions. And actually, Janice has <laughs> asked one in the chat, and it's exactly one of the ones that I would ask. So it says, she said, a very sad and touching story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How did you come to know her? And when did mm -hmm. she die? Well, we came to know um, Mary, Mary Ellen Walker. She was uh, a very good friend of uh, John Hodges, who's a Titanic author living down in Worcester. And John had said to me uh, many years ago, you're talking about 20, nearly 30 years, actually, <laughs> 70 years of flying in. So I remember 30 years ago, he said, would you like to meet this character? And I thought, wow. And it went into her house when she lived in Pershaw. Pershaw is a small village not far from Worcestershire in Great Melbourne. And they went into her house and, oh my goodness, she was like a grandmother. She made me feel, feel at home. And uh, I really, really just... I think you could say almost fall in love with myself at that point. She was like a maternal grandmother in a way. We sat and chatted and that's when she told me her story. I thought, oh my goodness, this is just incredible. You know, I could sit and listen to her for hours. And uh, sad to say that she passed away, I believe it was 19... Oh no, sorry, I do apologise. Yeah, we'd be 2000 and... 2006, I believe it was. Uh, the years are going in so fast, it's hard to, to get a pinpoint. But I remember it was 2005, 2006 time. Yeah. So you're talking about 16 years ago. Gosh. And it's just hard to believe because uh, we really miss her because uh, I used to phone her and she would phone me as well. And whenever you go on the phone, oh my goodness, she'd be on the phone for about two hours. She used to always say to me, I hope I'm not ringing your phone, but I'd say, no, 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 you're okay. <laughs> I just, just love to... Uh, just to get all the stories from her. It was a lady wow. that you never ever, didn't matter how many times you spoke to her, she would always be the same with you, treat you in the same way. And although some of the stories she would tell you were the same, she would tell you more as well. But it was almost a strange way that every time you spoke to her, something new would come out of her, her mind. You were like, wow, this is something I've never known. And I think what shocked me was when she showed me the sealskin purse 
and the diamond necklace. When I seen that for real and I held it in my hand, I was like, oh my goodness, this is just, this is history coming to life. This yeah. is something that Hollywood just cannot bring is touching these really iconic parts of history. And mm -hmm. as we said in the presentation, it was it's almost like a Catherine Cookson <laughs> novel yeah. or a dramatization in a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so Maureen's saying uh, she was ca captivated by the whole story. Thank you, Sean. You're very welcome. Thank you, Maureen. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And Bob and Barbara have said, we too were captivated by the story and presentation of it. Reminds me of so many stories of adopted children needing to know their yeah, roots, which it is, you know, and there, there was so very, many very children, true. when you look back at your family history, that perhaps yeah. were brought up by their grandparents as well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you know, it touches on a lot of, of stories that we've probably came across. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's one of these stories that, you know, I don't think like Titanic that will that will ever die. We'll always remember those those people involved, those people with the life's changed forever. And there's this poor Betty, you know, I mean, she, her life has changed totally for the whole of her life. Um, as you see, you know, adopted parents been brought up by, not, not disrespectful saying that, I mean, people are brought up with different people believing, you know, this could be their parents. And how devastating that must be to someone in their early teens to realise that they're almost living a lie in their life, that this yeah. person's not who they are. And mm -hmm. um, to think, that's not my mother. Yeah. <laughs> who is it so it must uh, be a traumatic time and it's post-traumatic stress as well not just by our mother going through that on titanic i really believe that betty went through that as well because of what happened with her finding out that her grandparents weren't our maternal mum and dad plus being abused to that degree by her own mother must have been horrifying yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> terrible know. That is. Uh, right, so we've got questions coming in. If there's any more, stick them in the chat. The one thing that I really want to ask you is, your business is obviously called Titanic Honour and Glory. Was yeah. that where your business started? Did, were you, is it, was it the Titanic story that started your business and then you kind of moved on to doing World War stuff? Or, Abs know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, to be honest, how, how it all started was that, I've been interested in Titanic my whole life since I was five years old and it all stemmed from an eight to remember and meeting survivors and people like Betty. Um, I mean, I, to be honest, I'm a trained uh, joiner carpenter. That's what I do is my, well, that was my job, but unfortunately right. through a disability, I, I couldn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm the type of person that just doesn't want to do anything. So I had to do something. So what I did was I managed to do the Titanic exhibitions to give me a new outlook in life that gives me something and use what I'd learned from all the other people involved with the Titanic to talk to school children and bring history to life in the classroom for them. So it started off with the Titanic, then it snowballed into another love of my, my own passion is World War II, World War mm -hmm. One history, um, through my personal connection with my grandfather who served in the Polish Armed Forces during the war. I think it's important to tell all those stories uh, that, that should never be forgotten. Yeah. I mean, history shapes yeah. us. It, it, it makes us who we are. Um, then going on to the JFK stories as well, we're a, plan a JFK exhibition at the moment on Kennedy because another man who was an incredible leader of his time, a man mm -hmm. who changed the 60s and could have made a massive difference in the country if mm -hmm. he was never sadly assassinated. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like yourself, history is amazing. And, yeah. you know, once you, you open the door to history, it almost pulls you in. <laughs> and you're, in a way, you're you're hooked, really, and you, you yeah. just try to get as much information in your mind and as you possibly can. I think it becomes um, addictive. I do. I mean, I really think it, it becomes addictive. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, there, there's all this talk about, you know, should it be certain things, war, war, war history and, oh, and different no, things definitely. be taught now in schools. But I really think mm. that, yes, it should be yeah. something that's continued because you can Absolutely. learn so much. You can learn so much from it. Um, so the other thing that I was going to mention was when I started doing my family history, I remember getting the list of the Titanic and all the people who died in the Titanic and going yeah. through them all saying, is there any family names within this? So I wonder yeah. how many other people actually, you know, did the it's, same. It's true though, because it's amazing, we, especially with the exhibition, you know, you'll, you'll set up an exhibition display and people come in and they'll look at the exhibition and they'll go to the big in memoriam wall and we give them a ticket and it's got a name on it and they'll look and they'll say, oh, that's the same surname as me and I'll, I'll be a Smith or a... 
Mm-hmm. And they'll say, or a sedunary, is that maybe they're connected to me? Then they go away and they'll get in touch with someone like yourself doing genealogy and they'll say, can you tell me if I've got a connection to here, then? Mm-hmm. Nine times out of ten, they could have. It could be a first or second, third, is it twice removed cousin yeah. or a great, great grandfather or aunt. And it's, then you find out there's other stories like Betty's where, you know, two members of the family went, <laughs> you know, and, and certain things happened and it was it was like almost covered up in a way. Yeah, um, yeah. And another that. fascinating one was uh, in Southampton recently, and we're, we're talking to a group of people about that, was uh, Sam Williams. Now, Sam Williams was a fireman on board Titanic, but the problem was he wasn't actually on the Titanic. He'd actually, as his, his uncle, sorry, his nephew said to me in Southampton, he said he belted a policeman when they're out celebrating his brother getting a job on the Titanic as a fireman. So his brother said, you need to get on the ship because you're going to be in big trouble. So he gave him all his documents, gave him his fireman sign on, away he went. So Sam went wow. on in place his brother. And when the ship went down, there's poor Sam goes down with the ship. And he was a hero. He was keeping the power going as well. Oh, gosh. And his mother never got anything from the Titanic Relief Fund purely because it was he wasn't oh. on the ship. His oh. brother was, but his brother was there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's, it's wee things like that that, that that fascinate me about history as well. These little nuggets, you call them, where stories evolve out of one story and you're thinking wow this is this is amazing <laughs> yeah yep yeah. um, right let's go through some more questions so Maureen's saying did Mary go on to have children herself and marry yeah she actually had a she had a son um and sad to say because of the I know it's not nice saying but they had a bit of a I wouldn't say they weren't that close they were close family but because of what she had came through with her own mother there was there was a bit of problem that developed with her own self that she found that difficult I think to you know to have a real closeness with a lot of family members that she 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 did live on her own quite a lot and her husband uh, was a London bus driver believe it or not but he was quite older than her and he sadly passed away in his senior years and she remained a widow right up until she passed away herself but the family never really to my mind anyway whenever whenever I was in contact with them with Mary and um, Betty, sorry, I never really seen much about her family coming in to see her or anybody really, she never really spoke about them, put, put it that way. That, that's what was strange to myself sometimes. And I remember I asked about, you know, how's your son and that, and she, she was just going to skip over things. And I thought, oh, maybe she doesn't want to talk about that sort of thing. So that's what gave me the impression that she was a wee bit, you know, there, she there had, wasn't she that had a hard life. I mean, she had Definitely. a bit of a hard life oh, was, and a lot of struggles. And so you can sort of, understand that I suppose um so that kind of leads on to the next question actually which is um <laughs> Bob and Barbara are asking what descendants were used to prove the DNA link that would be the Morleys the Morley family they 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 actually gave their uh DNA and it matched that of of uh, Betty herself so she had that line of, of the family if right. that makes sense so, so she she had, that, she take she take a DNA before she died then or I believe what happened was that she when she was doing her tests in hospital or she was getting some medical work done at hospital they were actually doing swabs and things like that so they managed to get a DNA swab from her and then they were able to I don't know how they do that but they preserved that in the laboratory the laboratory I believe it is and they managed to to match the two of them up. Uh, that's what we're being told anyway, which is which is fascinating because I, like yourself, I was quite surprised how how could they actually link that when she's sadly no longer with us? Yeah, uh, and I mean, that's they, to be done. yeah, they would have done it, I suppose, through you know her son, perhaps. Mm. Um, but then you know maybe absolutely, yeah, it could be her son as well. There's a thing yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah, but then I mean, if she's went into hospital and said mm. to the hospital that you know I've got this, you know, really big urge to basically. You know, mm-hmm. find out that this is my father. They might have, yeah. you know, done something to help us, I suppose. Just to try and help her. Yeah. And yep. I know that there's a lot of people we go in and visit her as well, um, like like ancestry. You know, people going in to speak to her just to get her story as well, so they could try and link up to see if they were also connected. Because obviously, the the Morley family was a big, big family. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. And plus, obviously, had two brothers, so you've got their family as well. You've got the generation after that, so you can imagine there is there is quite a huge. Uh, family connection yeah, there yeah and our granddaughter actually um very recently i believe it was it was the last year of the year before just after the lockdown and the first lockdown she actually was involved in getting a blue plaque unveiled near where the shop was in worcester 
um, right. Fourgate Street. So, so the the granddaughters are actually becoming involved in the Titanic story at the moment. I don't really know her too well to really comment. Um, you know what what what's sort her of capacity she's been doing a lot, but it's like everything else. Hopefully, our paths will cross at some point, and then mm-hmm. we can maybe discuss. You know what she's learned of her grandmother, and what you know. So we, what we've met as well, and a friend who's the author. Mm-hmm. Be interesting. <laughs> well, that's that. You know, you might find that you know other family members mm-hmm. of the Morleys will, will get to the point that you know they want to speak a bit more about things and share stories and get to know Absolutely. a bit more themselves. Yeah. Um, so Bob and Barbara have also asked, um, did she ever um, have a relationship with her grandparents after her mother took her from them? Yeah, I mean, she used to. She still used to go and see her grandparents. Um, she was quite quite close to her grandfather as well as her grandmother, and she she loved them very much dearly. And she would go to the, what it was called the lock keeper's house and regularly visit them up until they passed away. So she was very much still still close with them. But I think she still had this heartbreak that it was almost as she would say, it's like a lion away. It was almost she, she was lied to about all these years. But as they tried to tell her. They did it for our own good to protect her. I think that's how grandparents would look at their grandchildren. They were only doing it to protect her, to try and, you know, not, not for her to go through that trauma and that turmoil. But her mum was really, um, oh, it was terrible. I think she was in a bad, bad way. She she really struggled and uh, she did remarry again later in life. This was uh, her mother, Kate Phillips. And again, not being bad saying, but as Betty would say, as she... She ended up with a lot of different types of the wrong type of man, if that makes sense. It wasn't men that were really good to her. It was a, a terrible situation. And you just think that for her to see things like that and what she went through must have been absolutely horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, what a shame. Janice has said, um, I see your background, love of the sea. I guess, <laughs> you, wrote, she says, I guess you wrote this. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, the presentation and everything's been written by yourself because, you, you know, you've had that interest in the contact yeah with absolutely yeah, so, um, so she's saying will there be another movie <laughs> well it's funny you say that right so they're, they're talking about um doing uh possibly a, another docudrama so it's like a, a documentary type film uh, on the titanic and with various stories and obviously they'll look at other characters as well not just focusing on say two characters but that, i think that at the moment is in the pipeline. I'm trying to think who was doing that. It's one of the big uh, production companies in America that's been talking about that. Nothing's been released as yet, but that, that's the what I've heard in the grapevine through the Titanic circles in a way that there's a new uh, you know, docudrama coming out. Yeah. And hopefully this time it will be quite factual in a way as well, because uh, there's been a lot of documentary films in the past that you know seem to fabricate stories in and make characters that aren't real. But as you should just focus on you know, real people that and tell a story like especially like um Kate Louise Phillips and Henry Samuel Waller, that would make an amazing film actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you could look at the life after that where it would go on to the, you know, Betty and her life during the war, the, the you know, the notorious great yeah. twin trials with the passport, etc. Yeah. And then her life uh, trying the quest to become the rigid recognised as being her, her father's uh, daughter. That would be That's interesting. Because it, it's all these stories that spiral afterwards mm. as well, isn't it? You know, it's absolutely it's, it's, the stories, it's fascinating. You know, the, the people that went down with the Titanic, there was all these subsequent stories that, oh, that follow after it. Um, so Jane, well, I've, I've actually got two questions here, but one of them sort of replies to Jane. So Jane has said, "I wonder how often couples pretended to to be married so that they could share <laughs> a cabin aboard ship." <laughs> She said that uh, she's been she's been researching a couple who went down on the Lusitania. I cannot find uh-huh. a marriage for them on either side yeah. of the Atlantic. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and then uh-huh. Bob and Barbara have actually replied to Jane saying, I have one of those stories doing research for my elderly neighbour. Her father wow. left a wife and children uh, and children in England and came to mm-hmm. Canada with her mother. No marriage to be found. They were Catholics, so probably no ability for divorce. This was post World War One. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, there probably was a lot of that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think in the Lusitania that you mentioned, that that was a, a traumatic disaster as well. It was just so so uncalled for, really. And obviously, that brought the Americans into the First World War. And uh, I mean, she was saying that she was torpedoed because she was carrying armaments and things. Such a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And to think that there was a couple, you know, as your, your, your the lady was saying there, that were on the Lusitania, there's no record of being married in either 
continent. So that gives you another, in a way, as you say, it's quite common it must have happened at that time. Because, I mean, let, let's face it, things at that time were different from now. It's not really so much not being bad frowned upon now, but back in that time, oh my goodness, it was almost like you committed a heinous crime. Mm. It was, uh, you were the talk of the town, you were banished in a way. Families would 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 basically dismiss family members through it or they didn't want the shame or the disgust with it and it, it's terrible. Well, well, that's it. I mean, it wasn't as easy back then really to get, you know, a divorce Mm -hmm. Um, and there was all this, you know, international travel and, you mm -hmm. know, the, you could sort of disappear, you know, you could actually mm -hmm. just say, right, let's get, you know, save up, mm -hmm. jump on yeah. a ship, go away somewhere and kind of disappear. Mm -hmm. So it was, I suppose, a, um, a way out for some couples, you know, if, if there was no... Absolutely. And, no other way and I think, uh, as you say, there's a lot of stories that, that get told nowadays where People add arms and legs and all different sorts of things onto it to make it more elaborate and more grand. But to get the real story, I think, is always important to go to the people that were there or, or witness to that story. I think they give the, the generalised story that's up to date, is concise. Yes, fair enough, they might forget things, but at least it's a genuine uh, of what, what they went mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. I know. And then Bob, just to finish up, Bob and Barbara have said, you know, just what we really said, how many stories have developed um, on various oh, passengers' lives. And, and that's, you know, those yeah. that survived and those that obviously didn't as well. Uh, because, yeah. you know, when you think of the people who um, didn't survive, the impact that that perhaps had on family who were not on board the ship on that day as well. You know, it's a lot of uh, lives being absolutely. impacted. Absolutely. And uh, there's, there's a story of the of the Slade brothers. That's, that's an interesting one. It's a big impact on a family of a mother whose three sons were saved because they, they were so happy to getting a job on Titanic. They went out celebrating, so they went into the to the bar, the local bar that had a drink. Um, they got a wee bit worse of the wear and they had missed the sailing time because they didn't go back to the docks. The ship was almost, you know, the gangway was away, ready to go. And their mother always said, thank goodness you went into the bar for a drink because you would have lost your life and it's as you say, it's almost that hand of fate that comes down on people. It's yeah. it's quite strange. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and it's funny we were researching that when I was in Southampton recently, a couple of weeks ago, and we were looking at a story of a a lovely man whose father um, was a steward, and his wife was sewing his uh, cap badge on his his cap, and the cap badge actually disintegrated in her hand, and she thought, got a bad feeling about this, and look at what happened. It's like yeah. things like that, it's almost like a sign for some. <laughs> it's know, it's unbelievable. Gosh. But like you say, many stories definitely that we can come out of a situation like this, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So lots of thanks coming in from people. Thank you very much for the comments and thank you so much for your presentation today, Sean. It's been amazing. Um, as I said, Sean is going to be one of the speakers at the Kilty Culture um, event on the 15th of October. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've gathered from his presentation tonight, he spends a lot of time interviewing older people and also engaging with younger people and trying to get them interested in history. So he will be sharing some of the tips on how to do that with your own family and your own friends. So yeah, check that out. Um, just a, a couple of announcements before we finish up. If you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, why not join now? Annual membership ranges from 10 to 16 pounds per year. You receive three journals um, over that year, monthly e-news and just of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. And I've put a link for the website into the chat box. The next webinar will be on the 8th of September at 7 p.m. And the speaker will be Craig of the National Library of Scotland, who will tell us a bit more about their amazing map collection. Um, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar about, uh, familiar with. So tune in then. There is a link in the um, chat box where you can register just now and it will go out into the e-news as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of the week. I think um, certainly in Scotland it's supposed to be really hot. Um, and thank you again, Sean. You're very welcome. Thank you to everyone okay. for coming today. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay.